Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Chris Metzler, one of the programmers here at the Alexander Valley Film Festival. Thank you for joining us here uh, live and virtual today. Um, you know, we never really anticipated when we started a film festival that we would be uh, doing it virtual, but uh, there are some benefits to that. And part of that is to have an exciting uh, mid-afternoon Q&A uh, with one of our filmmakers. Uh, we're lucky enough to here to have uh, the writer, director, and kind of all around artist extraordinaire behind 499, Rodrigo Reyes. Thanks for being here, Rodrigo. Hey, thank you for inviting me. It's wonderful to be back in Alexander Valley, virtually in the ether. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Rodrigo had uh, was the award winner behind one of uh, the documentary shorts last uh, year. What was the title of the film again? It was titled Abuelos, and Abuelos. it's uh, now currently online, uh, living on on the topic uh, platform. Neat. So if uh, folks hadn't had a chance to see it at the festival last year, uh, go to topic.com and uh, they're really great um, streaming service. Um, before we begin, Rodrigo, uh, one of the things that um, the festival wants to do this uh, year is kind of read um, what's called a land acknowledgement. So if we can take a moment, I'm going to do that. Um, the Alexander Valley Film Society recognizes that we are on unceded lands of the Coast, Miwok, Pomo, and Wapo tribes. We respectfully acknowledge that the indigenous people who have lived here for thousands of years and who continue to contribute in meaningful ways to their communities and our society as a whole. Our shared history includes the genocide, forced removal and ethnic cleansing of indigenous people. Um, the Alexander Valley Film Society is committed to centering indigenous Hello, it looks like Chris froze up. <laughs> oh, Chris, you froze there for a second. Would you mind going back a few moments? Yeah, no worries. Uh, thanks again for everybody's patience in the Zoom world. Um, our shared history includes the genocide, forced removal, and ethnic cleansing of indigenous people. We at the Alexander Vil Valley Film Society are committed to centering indigenous voices and in stories to recognize the past and celebrate the resiliency of the native people and their culture. Our deepest thanks go to Nikki Myers Lim and the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center and Clint McKay from the Pepperwood Preserve for their assistance with this acknowledgement. Um, you know, I think this is really important. So please go visit our website to learn more at www.avfilmsociety.org backslash equity. Uh, so without further ado, um, you know, let's give that a moment to contemplate and we'll kind of begin our Q&A with uh, Rodrigo. Um, thanks again for being here, Rodrigo. I think maybe a good place uh, to start is, um, you know, I remember chatting with you about this project several years ago at a bar, and I always wondered, like, how in the world is Rodrigo going to pull this off? And you wound up coming back with this just absolutely very cool film, um, just, you know, not only beautiful, but thought provoking and I think important. So maybe you can kind of share uh, with us in the audience, like, what was the genesis of this idea? And why is it that you felt that you just couldn't let it go and make this movie? You know, you know, I've, I've always, thank you, thank you for that, Chris, actually. And uh, yes, we did talk about this in a bar, <laughs> the best place to talk about movies. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've been in love with history and specifically Mexican history. I think, uh, you know, my country has a very unique relationship to history in the sense that it, it has obsessed over it, you know, constantly. And the one chapter that I think has come up time and again i mean you could be reading about the revolution or you know the 1940s in mexico and and the conquest comes up you know like this idea of the conquered and the vanquished and um so it's something that as a as a very young child i got in touch with through my dad who is uh who's a historian by trade and back in the day in mexico city you know we would go together to these museums and these archaeological sites and I, I I always thought it was um you know it was kind of awesome that my dad like uh you know felt that he could just bring a kid along you know five six years old he could bring me along um but he always you know expected a lot and um and I kind of enjoyed that and I fell in love with history just like he did and as the years went by I you know I started making movies and and suddenly I was like, wait a minute, 2000, you know, 
it's the 500th anniversary of the arrival of Cortez and the the so-called conquest of the Aztecs. We got to make a movie about this. And, um, you know, I think when you watch the movie, it feels like it's like really intense and really like packaged. But in reality, the movie went through a lot of different versions. Uh, in the very beginning, it was, it was supposed to be a comedy. So, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I just don't want to remind anybody in the viewing the audience, there's a chat box. So uh, Rodrigo and I are going to continue a conversation for a few minutes. But if there's any questions, feel free to put them up the chat box at any point in time, and we'll kind of incorporate them into the Q&A. Um, so yeah, uh, so um, obviously with the final film, in the sense of when you initially envisioned it as a comedy, what was the thing that kind of um, took it on this path that you felt that obviously a, a kind of a little bit more of a thoughtful and serious approach? Well, what ended up happening was I was like, we're going to do this comedy. It's going to be on horseback. We're going to ride from Veracruz up the Sierra Madre, you know, like go from sea level to like 4,000 meters um, all on horseback. And we're going to, in our, in our adventures as filmmakers, we will replicate the, the, the absurdity of, of empire building. And, you know, pretty soon, a producer on the film Inti, he was like, dude, have you ever been on horseback for a day? Have you been on horseback for a week? Like, no, like you're going to kill everybody. Like <laughs> you don't have the body to do this. And he was absolutely right. And then we started, you know, reflecting on this anniversary and realized, I realized that along the route, there were a lot of like critical social issues. It was almost like if you were to take an x-ray of the country, on this on this path you know from the coast to the highlands and the Me and mexico city and then he said well what if we brought back people from history to see what what has become of mexico and that's what things started clicking and we started mm. cooking and we realized man like this is a great idea um it cannot be a comedy it has to be something serious but you know bringing back four or five characters is a lot it's a lot of introduction for for audiences it's a lot of you know it's it's almost like falling into the trap of trying to decipher history which i think is the biggest problem you know we have that in america right like people like you know believe that they can like somehow interpret what george washington and jefferson thought um specifically about something happening today right so like we wanted to avoid that and 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 so we we pinned it down to the one character that i feel like was was the most necessary and at the same time the most hated um like the the conquistador you know mexico still has like a cultural grudge of sorts with this character and i was like well let's bring him from the shadows let's let's bring him out and see what's see what happens when he goes on this journey so so things started clicking i mean you know it took a while but you know like we had a lot of prep time we had a couple years of research and just thinking like how is this going to work? Because it sounds crazy, you know? So how's it going to work? How's it going to really make sense? Yeah. And, um, so there's a question from the Q&A um, audience um, from Chelsea. And so uh, she asks, um, it sounds like it was always going to be a documentary, but the narrative historical fictional aspects of the film um, were folded in afterwards. Is, is that... Uh, um, can you tell us a little bit more about at one point in time, did you know there was this documentary component and how did you find the people that were going to, you know, be interviewed and who uh, the character of Cortez was going to uh, interact with? They both kind of happened at the same time, you know, like I was just as interested in this myth as I was in reality. And I think what I realized when I started seeing the stories that were coming out, like the real news stories that were coming out of places like Veracruz or Puebla, like, you know, this whole region, you know, you can see a lot of clear echoes between the practice of violence in the past and today. And um, so, for instance, like Veracruz on the coast is the most, uh, the deadliest state to be a journalist. It's, it's, it's a place where many people have been murdered for practicing um, journalism. And, and in a way, that is very much an echo of what the, what the Spanish did when they, um, you know, censored and burned and destroyed a lot of narratives in, 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 in their, you know, conquering, establishing process. And I remember, 
I got married sometime before I made the film and my wife and I went to, uh, you know, like Cancun area, like south of there. And then we went on a day trip to Chichen Itza. And Chichen Itza is like, you know, world famous, you know, modern wonder of the world. But around there is a little town called Isamal. And in that town, there's a giant church built on top of like um, the Mayan temples. So like, it's like a, like you, you're climbing this hill, you're like, oh, why did they put this, this church in a hill? Well, it's because it's on top of a, of a Mayan <laughs> temple. <laughs> and, uh, and that square in front of the church, that atrium is the site of one of the biggest uh, book burnings in, in the Americas. They burned all these Mayan books. And, uh, and so that really helped, I think, for things to click because you're like, man, like this bishop burnt all these books and then he regretted it. And he, be, he tried to become a, you know, an advocate for the Mayans, but he had destroyed like their patrimony, their cultural patrimony, you know, um, things that we will never recover. Um, and so I started seeing these echoes. And, and so I knew right away that, yes, there has to be this real life component, but it doesn't have to feel like a documentary, like a, like a traditional documentary either. And we have this like magic realist character that kind of turns everything into like a very trippy odyssey you know because it's like this guy looks very real he acts very real but he he's obviously fake but then he's interacting with people who have gone through some serious stuff um and then to the second part of the question about um how uh th there there was a question about uh how did i connect with the characters right uh so uh yeah i was wondering like um at what point in time did you um, did you go and do a lot of research ahead of time? And then so, because obviously you have this actor with you. Um, and so in the sense of like, unlike um, some documentaries, there isn't as much research and development. It's like, you're kind of, you know, running into yeah, people in. as you travel. But um, with this, how did you kind of organize um, the kind of shoots to be able to incorporate the actor? Well, you know, on the one hand, the actor needed to have a journey. Like he, the character needed a journey. He needed stops. And I, and I developed like an emotional route with the help of a screenwriter friend named Lorena, Lorena Padilla. And so like, there was, a, there was like this like route and I knew that the route was going to be like a sinking, you know, like, a, like he's sinking. He's just getting, things are getting worse um, for him. And he's going through all these very kind of negative emotions. But then I also had to think, well, like, I can't show up at somebody's house who, you know, has had their dad murdered or is looking for their son who was disappeared. I can't show up and say, hey, you know, we're here to interview you and here's the, here's my colleague, the conquistador. No, I, you know, and, and thinking about that a lot led to questions about how do you, how do you reach out to folks and explain such a, such an out there idea. And, you know, that really forced me to confront why I was making the movie and, and, and to be open to sharing it to people, which documentarians, I feel we don't always have that process of saying, I'm trying to make a film about this. And, you know, would you let me into your space and everything? It, it, it's a little bit more organic and more like, like kind of on the go. Um, but with this project, I had to, you know, have a lot of long conversations with all of the people involved. Um, even with the migrant shelter scene, you know, there's this, scene where the conquistador shows up at a, at a migrant shelter halfway to the border and you know he he's already beat up he's like starving he asks for food you know he takes shelter there we did a whole like announcement there um you know the night before and the day of like talking to the general community of migrants and explaining our project so you know it sounds ridiculous to stand there and say, hey, you know, we're here with an artistic project and it's, you guys are on the path of Cortez, but that's kind of like what, what gave the connection um, validity and authenticity, you know, because people had the option to approach us. Some people shared stories, but didn't want to be on camera. Other people, you know, like there was a dialogue and it enriched the movie. Um, so it was basically constantly that, like just explaining the concept and trying to, to connect with folks and listen to them and, and, and make them feel comfortable enough to share their ideas. So that's why you see the conquistador, you know, 
in their space like he's he's in the room of like the a, a missing son and he touches his uniform and he, he was a police officer so he holds his gun but that was all like something that we discussed very heavily with 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 uh with the mom right who was the character in that chapter and, and so on so i think i for me it was just like this lesson of like you know just share share your ideas with the world because the world is bound to come back with like some really good feedback and that's how they become real you know um you can't go into into regular people's homes and just script them and tell them you know treat them like they're all of a sudden actors you have to you have to kind of like establish a relationship did, did you find that um did you hear anything back from uh some of the folks in the film like whether this process was cathartic to them at all i mean in the sense that like they weren't just talking to a filmmaker but you know did this con this kind of construct give them some openness to like maybe explore or share in ways that they wouldn't normally have wanted you know well i think the the magic of of a film like 499 is that you can ask questions about people's emotions you can ask very kind of like like personal questions and not so much about the facts of the case um i i as you guys noticed there's like no um there's no real facts in terms of like names and culprits and folks to accuse there's none of that i avoided that for the safety of us and for the safety of the people that we're interviewing because i can't guarantee that nothing will happen to them if they share that information so you know i i, I that's that's kind of how i i tended to approach it it's just to 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 ask these deeper questions and then we would have these dialogues with the people about like you know you you're fighting for justice you're fighting to be heard in in so many words right you're fighting for the for your community and your country to listen well here he is he's 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 one of the foot soldiers of that of the the architecture of power he's one of the people that that needs to listen and i think mm -hmm. that part was a bit cathartic but i'm reluctant to say that there was a full catharsis because all the cases are still open. They're still yeah. fighting uh, the, you know, I think in June or July, uh, we're going to do an event with a, with a journalist organization, uh, um, you know, remembering the, the character at the beginning of the movie who was murdered for, for being a journalist. So, so those cases are still open. There's still no justice. Um, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm hesitant, but we've remained in touch with all the, all the people in the film. Neat. Um, we have another question from the audience. This one is from Rowan A. Um, it seems like this person might be familiar with your work, Rodrigo. Um, one thing we get from your films and you as a director is a strong affinity for your protagonists. Even though Cortez is carrying complicated baggage, you manage to find humanity in him. Can you talk about this? And is this a deliberate choice for you as an artist? Yeah, no, Rowan, that's a great observation. I, you know, that was a really hard thing. Like uh, I had a, a, a big wrestling that went on, you know, how sympathetic to make this guy. But I realized, you know, the the point of studying history and, and looking at history isn't to punish, isn't to chastise and to pick winners and losers. It's really to understand. And if we wanted to understand this man, we had to like see his worldview but not not necessarily validate it um and i think that's that's part of the process of of really engaging in a deeper reading of our past it's like where do folks come from like this guy himself the conquistador was an, a migrant in in a way he was leaving a very broken europe a broken spain you know and 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 it, it's proven because over the next century you know, from 1521, after the Spanish Armada and everything, Spain was just like continuously bankrupt, you know, and their nobilities were, were living in crazy poverty. And, and that, that's not, you know, all in the film, like, it's not a history lesson, but there is the sense of like, this person has had some hopes and had some intentions, and felt that he was in control. And in his worldview, like, all of that was valid. Um, of course, 
with the magic of movies, he he's now confronted with like a perspective that none of us will ever have. We'll never be able to look 500 years into, our, you know, from the future into our present. But uh, but he does, and he has to wrestle with the meaning of 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 his choices. You know, at the same time, I felt a lot of um, connection to him in the sense that he was looking for meaning, you know, like there's moments in the film where he stops in the market and he sees a Jesus and he's like, you know, and it's like real. And then at the end when he's desperate, you know, he goes and visits the Virgin and, and that's real too. And he visits her, you know, like a sinner does and like all the other sinners that are there. Right. Cause he's not the only one. So um, I kind of figured out how to be kind to him without being uh angry at him because i didn't feel like it had any point to stay angry and none of the characters in the film were angry at the character they they wanted to be heard you know like it, it, they wanted they wanted this process to move forward um so at what point in time how much did the film kind of evolve while you were filming it you know i mean obviously all fiction films um um you evolve, but with documentary films, often you're kind of trying to find the story while you're there. You talked about collaborating with a screenwriter friend ahead of time. Um, so at what point in time, how much did you, were these ideas just kind of adding layers to it while filming versus were there any kind of different paths that you went on during production that you just wouldn't have expected, I guess? Well, I think the key to a movie that is a documentary hybrid is you cannot, you cannot, tighten the script too much if you tighten it you choke the story because you don't have the, the the resources to control everything you know like you cannot control the scenes you can't do reshoots that easily you have to flow so I, I i approached it more like you know all my research and my scripting was was um to build maps you know or to build toolkits but then once you got there, you were like, okay, well, how do we, how, so for instance, in act one, at the end of act one, you know, he gets caught by the indigenous police. How, how do you manifest horror and, and, and fright? You know, I, I don't know. We had to get there to the location. We had to figure out, you know, what, what is it, the conditions like? How does the scene play? Um, what are the, the other um, protagonists or other, other participants willing to do you know and they were willing to carry him off and 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 chase him and do all these things um but but i didn't know what any of that would look like but we had the idea that he's going to be caught the same thing when the poet lets him go like you know it, it we visited his house he hosted us he he fed us and then he showed us his workshop and we were like this is where he's going to hold him you know, so it was trying to listen to reality was the key, I think. Um, and we would rewrite every day. That's the honest truth. And then mm -hmm. in the edit, we rewrote and rewrote and rewrote the film many, many times because of the way it's set up, you can move pieces around and move the order of things a lot. And, um, and then the voiceover changes everything. So writing that voiceover changed everything and like the last three weeks of the edit i must have rewritten it like 10 times you know that was my job while while the lead editor was like you know reworking the structure i would write and write and write new voiceover for the film so yeah. um it's kind of like knowing that you're not going to get to the answer at the end of the shoot you're just going to survive the production <laughs> and then you're going to you're going to do something else you know go into another battle in the next stage Nice. Um, so let's talk a little just about, uh, we have a few more minutes left, the kind of cinematic language of the film. I mean, um, you know, this film is kind of shot in some ways, kind of like um, the grandiose kind of Hollywood epics of the 50s and 60s, like, you know, the Ten Commandments or Ben-Hur. And so um, you can you tell us a little bit about your decision making process of like that why you felt that the film kind of deserved that sort of scope and then what it does to us as audiences when we experience it. So, so, you know, that's a great question because to me, um, like, honestly, I was scared of the format. I was really scared of using this very wide format. I was like, you know, it doesn't, 
it's not something that I know how to use. It's not something that I know how to apply. And I can't think in this like super wide, but the cinematographer really fought for it. And he argued that, you know, how are you gonna make reality and fiction live together? Let's take this kind of aesthetic that says epic film, you know, 10 Commandments, Lawrence of Arabia, um, and there's, you know, they still make these historic, historic films like that and uh, Gladiator, you know, uh, and let's take it out into the street, you know, and he had a whole proposal. He knew what lenses he needed. He knew that he could do it with available light and only one assistant, you know, the, the, the film actually won an award at Camera Image, which is like a mm. really important, perhaps like the most important cinematography festival in the world, uh, only for cinematographers. And um and, you know, he fought for this idea of like, how do we, how do we, you know, place these images in a way that, that they look organic. And, and it, he, he was absolutely right, because this is also the language that history is written with, right? Like this is how history is represented in, in big Hollywood productions. So it makes sense to kind of like tweak it and, and turn it inside out, you know? So I was very happy by it. It took like it took like two weeks before I, I felt like I knew what, what I was doing with, with this format. You know, it took like half of the first production trip because it was scary. But um, I, I, I really love that, that you know, my, my, my DP pushed me to, to make that decision. Nice. And um, before we kind of get to wrap in, if there's any other questions, the audience, uh, please send them in the chat box. And so um, one of the things I noticed that you kind of were talking about, Rodrigo, it seems like there are a lot of things in this this film that, um, you know, there were a lot of fears, you know, and you just kind of leaned into these challenges of, you know, a lot of this uncertainty. And so, you know, as a filmmaker, how do you kind of ground yourself in being able to kind of live with all this uncertainty all the time, but also have a confidence of vision to kind of move forward? I'm still here. So, so I don't, I don't know how, how to answer that except with like a lot of anguish, you know, <laughs> it's just an anguishing process for me. And I feel like, like I, I really um, lean on, on, hello, Chris, can you guys still hear me? Yeah. I yes, feel like, we can like, hear you. Sorry. Like I, I really <laughs> lean into, into my, my support team, you know, like I lean into everybody from my parents to my wife and my producers, you know, like it, it's a, it's a constant, it's a constant kind of sharing of the anguish a little bit. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, but, but luckily I guess I've just been, I've, I've, I've been exposed to enough experiences where I realized like, man, like, you have to have faith like movies are just about faith like and you just pray that they're gonna work and you do your best you know um it, having it too too tight becomes like a nightmare as well because then then it's like you never took a risk the film was like you know it was born pre-cooked you know like you didn't you didn't have to put it together you know there's no flavor in it so um i i appreciate that more now but I think like, you know, 499 kind of came, you know, four or five years ago was when I started it. So it came at a moment where I felt that pressure and it really scared me. But I think I loved the project more in a way. So so I was willing to try to do it. <laughs> um, and, and it's not a project that can be done safely. You know, it's a risk. Nice. Well, it, I think there's a lot of flavor in this film. And I think people out there might be curious, um, you know, what's up next for you, uh, filmmaking wise, and then also, how can we kind of help spread the word about 499's release later this year? Well, well um, so up next for me, I'm working on a film about a friend of mine who's incarcerated, and he's doing life without parole. So that movie is called Sanson and Me. And uh, he, the film is uh, supported by PBS. And he and I have been collaborating for like 10 years on this project. So I'm really excited for that. I hope to share with you next year. Um, we're like, you know, in the state, the final stages of editing now. And, um, and as far as 499, um, this summer, we're hoping to do a, a tour along the actual route of the film, the route of 
Cortez and his soldiers. We're going to do a tour with pop-up screenings outdoors. And, um, you know, I'm really excited for that because the final screening is going to be on August 13th, which is the actual day of the surrender. So that's going to be awesome. And, um, and after that, in late summer, we're going to start releasing the film in the U.S. So you'll hear from me, you know, um, about, about those release plans and hopefully it'll be in theaters and people can see it on the big screen, which I think is like, it's a huge plus for this film to watch it on a big screen. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited for that. And, and I hope that we can just continue in communication and, and visiting each other. Nice. And, uh, Twitter and Facebook, it's a RR cinema. Is that right? RR cinema on Instagram and, uh, on, on Facebook, it's 499 cinema. Very nice. So folks, uh, follow those accounts. Uh, Rodrigo always has cool things up his sleeve. So thanks again for sharing 499, Rodrigo, and being part of the Alexander Valley Film Festival this year. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, everybody. Uh, take care, everybody, and thanks for uh, those in the audience for joining us. Bye-bye. Take care.